we're going to talk about platform security, right? So who here has a desktop machine at home? Right, don't be shy. Raise your hands. OK, OK. How many are ga gamers? Oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> kudos. Brave soul. How many of you have laptops? Everyone. How many of you can guess the number of CPUs on your laptop? Throw a number. Yell it. It's fine. How many? Three. Three. What? Hmm? Twenty. That's oh, you're killing it. A lot. <laughs> let's let's put it that way. Uh, CPUs. How many CPUs? So um, let's start looking, talking about the the classic desktop motherboard, right? This is a picture I pulled off uh, the internet. I think it's an MSI. So we know there is the one major CPU on a platform we all recognize as X cores and whatever. But there are also uh, this one, and 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 that one. All of these chips on the motherboard have some sort of a processor in them. Yeah. Either it's an ARM, an ARC, sometimes MIPS, uh, could be oh, a 8051. 8051. So mentioning 8051, who here heard about bad USB? All of you. Bad USB is basically an attack based on an 8051 architecture. This is how uh, a modern platform looks like. This, in this case, it's a MacBook Air. And as you can see, we have a bunch of buses going all over the all over the platform. When I say bus, I mean USB is a bus, uh, uh, PCI is a bus. Some, some here may, may or may not have heard about the LPC bus. All, right, all these buses uh, convey data from point to point. This says Broadcom, whatever. This thing has its own architecture, its own uh, CPU and handling and everything. So it has a bootloader. It has, it has ROM code, bootloader on a ROM code. It has RAM. It has... Uh, firmware you load, either, either the driver loads it at runtime and, and you get code executing on this independently, right? And it's just one. Here's another one. Uh, here's another NXP here. There's the uh, Texas Instruments, the TI. Touchpads, okay, uh, laptop touchpads. The, what's it called touch, the touch sensor area, whatever you call it. Um, those ones are typically... Well, the modern ones are USB connected, so it's a USB device. The camera, the webcam is a USB device. I've seen a DSP now, an audio chip that has its own codecs and, and up updatable firmware and, and everything. By the way, um, any comment, question, or anything you might want to ask, just ask, yell, it's fine, don't wait. I love feedback. Continuing on. The same MacBook, this is what it looks like. Right, you open it up. This is from iFixit if you want a reference. You can see all the components on the PCB, and you can guess. If you look at it, you can say, okay, this chip is on that part of the board. We can see it's next to a lot of power components. It might be a power-related controller. We'll go into that in a second. Uh, okay. Here's the other side of the board. Let's see if there's a good example here. What is it, Broadcom? That's how it looks like. There's, so there's... There's this, which you'll see in, in, in high-level specs and schematics or whatever. You look for architecture, functional diagrams or whatever on the internet. You see this. You can't understand any of this. But you need to see a real-life example. This is how it looks like on the board. And the, the locations of them give you hints about what they do and how they talk to each other. Another thing that sometimes it's not on the, the motherboard itself is also the peripherals. Right, so uh, we're talking about uh, NGF or M2 slots. It's also known as NGFF, uh, next gen form factor. Hard drives, right? You all have seen um, these hard drives on the left, PCIe based. Well, the connector is PCIe on the right too, but the modern ones have M2, which is basically the same here. The same as here, but with, uh, with two notches. 
This one has one. If you see one with two notches, it's called an M2 connector with a different key. So peripherals have their own, um, their own brains, right? Sometimes the, if, it's, uh, if it's a Broadcom, a uh, wireless card, you can tell, you can see the, it says Broadcom, and uh, there's two antenna clips here. That has uh, CPU, it has their, its own uh, firmware chip, and it's an EEPROM or a SPI chip, and uh, from, from an SSD perspective, you, you get the NAND, of course, but there's also a controller on every one of them. So even the, the, old, the ancient hard drives have their own controller, and it's usually an 8051. Why do we care? Like, let's talk about as an attacker. I'm an attacker. Why do I care? So, I have malware. I write malware. I want to do some cool stuff with it. So I can use any peripherals on the on the platform for for stealth. Right? You you want to evade AV? You want to split your 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 payload somewhere where you keep them where where it's not accessible. You can use onboard EEPROMs to, for storage if you have access to. Uh, yeah, but because it's a completely independent execution environment, AV doesn't have the ability to actually look into these alternate execution places. So you could have code that it has been completely compromised, and AV just can't tell. And it 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 might be able to ask questions and like send requests to these devices, but the the device firmware could have been updated to basically give responses that look legitimate and it could later have some uh, some uh, malware that gets triggered by a specific action or maybe happens at a later time something like that there are there is no way of defending against this that that you know we know of like the 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 protections that exist are per per vendor per chip so if broadcom has their own secure firmware update mechanism you better hope everyone else does. Right? If Intel has it, Broadcom. So there's an, an example later on of a, like Fizon, for the bad USB, didn't. Right? So you just upload your firmware, whatever you want, and you have your own code running on the damn controller. Yeah, I mean, th this is a space that hasn't really been explored in a huge amount of detail yet, just because there are so many different devices. And, and people have, have started to look at this a little bit, but because they're all vendor specific and everybody does things a little bit differently, there isn't really a good overall way to fix this problem yet. And in the old days, it was it was expensive to build a high capacity, you know, capability chip. Now, with technology advancing, every every what was used to be a, a dumb chip, uh, it's now easier and more. It's cheaper to manufacture something that's smarter and it's upgradable and it's updatable for for. OEMs to, to, to have on the platform. It's good for them, it's good business. Um, you, get, you get to support new capabilities. If there's new, new codecs coming out, you have a, an updatable uh, audio codec chip, which used to be like hard-coded, we say, uh, on die. Uh, and now you can firmware update it and you can support whatever audio codec you want. They yeah, do it. And also just because everybody, there there's so many usage models for where people are are trying to come up with new new things and push more things in the platform, make everything connected. There, there's so much more devices that are going into your system. So like if you open up Device Manager and list all of the USB devices in your system, you might have like eight USB devices, even though you don't have anything connected internally to the external parts, just because there are a lot of internal things like your webcam and other devices like that. And some of them, some of the older devices or smaller devices might have limited resources, like only a little bit of uh, code execution, but it still might be enough to get an interesting payload in it. Yeah, you'd be surprised how many devices you have internally connected by USB, like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, sometimes it's USB, with a thought. Uh, so we said uh, stealth, persistence, uh, low-level security bypass. You might be able to impact... Um, so an, a good example would be uh, malware running on a system attacking a driver of a specific device by talking to that device and having it cause a overflow or a, a bug trigger in the driver, right? So you go low level and then back up. And when the driver co communicates with the device, it, it gets something it doesn't expect and you just own the driver. So from ring three to bring minus one to ring zero. 
uh, it's with the USB attacks, it's possible. It's the easiest example. If I can control the USB, uh, uh, well, the, the, the st let's say, the, 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 this manufacturer string, and the driver is written poorly, and I can put in a payload there and I can manipulate the driver, then I'm totally owning the system. Yeah, I mean, especially if you have a, a device driver that is expecting to talk to the firmware that that, man, that vendor created, they likely aren't expecting it to return certain types of malware or certain types of anomalous traffic back from this device firmware because they, they'll typically have like a functional validation plan where they only make sure that it works based on what they're expecting, but they might not. Like if, if, the, if the firmware it's in the device itself has been compromised, uh, you're more likely to be able to exploit something in the driver through that, that mechanism. And as Mickey was pointing out, like with USB, you can say, I am this specific device that has nothing to do with what it really is, and just say, I, I am a Microsoft keyboard, and load that. Or if there's a particular USB driver that you know has a vulnerability, you can say, I am this device, just to load that driver so that you can talk to it and exploit that driver. <laughs> So it's, there's some interesting flexibility there. Well, data intercept is also an interesting yeah. concept when, uh, when you can compromise one USB device and listen to others. Uh, side channel, so you can covertly listen to sensors. So laptops have a G sensor on them, so you can know uh, when someone's typing the keyboard. There, there's been prior research about phones listening on, uh, on the desk, and you can tell what password the person is typing in by listening to the G sensor on a on on phone. So imagine how easy it would be if it was inside the laptop already. Yeah, everybody knows about like hacking into the webcam or something. Yeah. So. Um, well, privilege escalation was like the, the, the uh, exploiting the driver. Well, a, a lot of people think of like if, if you. If, if, if you have code already running on the system, why would you care about some of these devices? And you can actually use some of these, the capabilities in these hardware devices that are attached to the platform in order to do privilege escalation to get access to something that you didn't ha already have access to. So uh, that, that is possible depending on the capabilities of the particular device that is connected in your platform. And the fun part is the VM escapes. Right? So if you have uh, access from a guest to uh, Poorly virtualized hardware, you can, or maybe semi virtualized hardware, you can access that hardware and impact the host. Now, let's review a little bit uh, of the attack surface. Let's do a thought exercise of some sort. So, um, this would be a MacBook Air. I'm sorry for the example with Apple. Uh, this is just the, the, the highest res pictures we could find online. And because everyone cares how an apple looks inside, the sad part is for these chips, the the data sheets that you could usually find for each chip online, Apple. Uh, it seems that Apple has this NDA signed with each OEM. So when they do manufacture a chip for Apple, you cannot find the data sheet. So we had to find the sister chips or the brother chips or whatever that's close enough. I was gonna look by one by one and. See what we uh, what we get. So um, let's see, eight gigs, eight gigs of RAM. Um, why do we care about that? So RAM usually has an SPD chip. It's a small EEPROM that holds a few kilobytes of, of flash that tells the host computer, "I am X amount of gigabytes manufactured by this manufacturer." And BIOS sees it, loads it, and categorizes everything. Blah blah blah. There has been an old attack where you can just change the SPD if you have eight gigs of RAM. You say uh, I modified the, um, that little tiny chip uh, content, and then I now have 512 megs. And you get overlapping. And you can, if someone is uh, expecting to write to a different area of memory, and it's double mapped, so you can access that area that they think they, not, they don't have access to. It kind of don't make sense, I know, but... Well, it, it, it basically is you have two different... You do have two different uh, physical addresses that map... You, well, you have two different addresses that you can send a request to that map to the same physical uh, logic cells in the, the RAM. And it actually is that if, if you have like a, a, a one gig DIMM and you, you update the SPD to, to specify that you have a two gig DIMM, then because, the, because, the, RAM, because the, the BIOS configures the memory configuration to say, I have two gigs and it expects that you have two gigs, uh, but when you actually send the request to the chip itself, that, that top uh, bit of the address is just ignored, 
So you have two different addresses that both map to the same address within the DIM. And that can basically get around certain uh, memory protections. So like if you could have two, you could have, if your paging tables are set up a certain way to allow access to this particular region but not this particular region, all you need to do is write is read and write through the address that gives you access to that region, and you can you can bypass a number of controls. So that type of memory alias is is a can be a big problem. Thanks, Jesse. So uh, EMMC. EMMC is following a spec by a group called JDEC, and um, the latest one is 5.1, I think, or they do it at 5.1. Oh, the latest one I know of is 5.1. And EMMC covers a lot of things. So EMMC, every one of you, uh, if you have a phone, you have an EMMC chip on it. Uh, NAND, uh, some USB chips, USB storage devices have EMC, EMMC. Uh, SSD hard drives, all of those have EMMC, and they, and they have to follow the spec. So uh, the JDEC spec is about what, 800 pages long. And it specifies whatever you have to follow it as an EMMC chip, you have to do A, B, C, D. And they introduced a new feature, uh, field firmware update. This is new. You can update the firmware on an EMMC chip. You couldn't do that in the past, but you can do it now, which is funny. Uh, no mention of security. There is a disable bit. Though, but if you don't set it properly, you might be able to update the firmware with malicious firmware and then disable firmware updates so it will be stuck forever with malicious firmware. Yeah. Ah, the NXP chip. So this little microcontroller on the MacBook is uh, this block diagram, functional block diagram that, uh, that I found for that kind of family of chips. This runs an ARM Cortex M0. That's the chip, just that chip. It has a bunch of stuff. So you can tell how complex this is. It has its own, where's the uh, laser pointer thingy? Oops. So that, well, you can choose both. Oh. Okay, fine. Can't do both. So it has SRAM, it has ROM. It has a flash area. Yeah, and it, it has Mondi flash right there. All, you, all what you all see here, it's on die. This is the functional image of the silicon of the chip, right? So this is what inside. This is what is inside. It has all these things. I square C bus it has those controllers. It has its own uh, USB device controller, GPIOs. Yeah. You know, it's like you know Travis Goodspeed had packet and packet. This is uh, computer in computer. And the, the thing is, this is... I mean, it, it's, it's also similar to uh, Goodspeed's uh, Face Dancer. So yeah, th this exactly. has a, a USB connection to the platform. So if you have your own custom firmware running in this device, you can basically send whatever... You can have it show up as any type of USB device that you want and send whatever traffic that you want. So you can do very similar things, but it's already built into your platform. You don't need to plug something separate into it. But is there an app for that yet? It's a MacBook, right? Can Probably I get this yeah. in the Mac store? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe? I'll, I'll call Travis and find out. <laughs> uh, these two. They've got a temperature sensor and a TI power converter. We don't care about that. Those are dumb chips. Uh, skipping. Oh, Intel. Intel is fine. Intel is fine. We don't care about Intel. Uh, DDR. Who would be batshit crazy enough to work at Intel? <laughs> Except for the fun stuff, another 128 gigs. Uh, that's a DDR. That's probably the GPU. Oh, where is this? Broadcom. Oh, the so there is a frame. He's a guy fascinated by his own slides. <laughs> is, is a frame. <laughs> if you see, we're at this point. I screwed up the slides. There is a frame here. You barely see it. If we look at this Broadcom chip on this platform, that's a Cortex ARM3. And it has 60K of RAM, 320K of ROM. That is big, right? So this is code that runs inside the chip that's flashed on die when they make the chip. 
So if you find a vulnerability, you cannot patch it. Unless you have specific uh, preloading code in the ROM code that checks, do I have patches in a flash area? And if I do, fix it and then do it. But usually, if there is a vulnerability in ROM code, there's no way to fix it. We just have to buy a new one. Yeah, and, and desolder and solder it back on the board. Another so-called Wi-Fi module, another ARM Cortex. So we got three ARMs so far, and I'm not counting everything else. So three is the right guess so far. Uh, yeah, we can, we can skip this. It's, a, it's another ARM core. This is how it usually looks. It has all these um, connections to the platform, either UART SPY, I2C, I2S for the audio, and it's probably for uh, Bluetooth uh, pairing for uh, audio. And the EC, the embedded controller, the one that controls all the, uh, the power stuff is the easiest way to explain it. That's a Cortex-4. Uh, it's another ARM processor. This one has a mega flash on it. And it has its ROM. You can see it explains. It has a bootloader on it. Uh, the, the driver lib has its own AES CRC. So that's uh, on die. And another Ethernet bootloader on the, on the chip. It, explain, it explains that the, the debug interface, SWD and JTAG as the debug interfaces, and so on and so forth just lists all the capabilities of that chip. So it, it, when, when uh, vendors like TI, Texas Instruments, make a chip, they make it as robust as possible. Some of these, uh, we can see it here, CAN controller. So this has a CAN bus. This chip sits in a Mac, right? But it's, they, they make it for everyone. You want to use it, use it. You, you, you want to use it in a car, here you go, it's ready. You want to use it in a MacBook, here you go. Just write the firmware, sign it, you're good. Hopefully sign it. Hopefully, yeah. Maybe not. So um, it's an interesting case. There's a company called Pluggable, and they make these uh, HDD docs. And um, they use a controller that's made by a company called Ass Media. I'm not making this up. Uh, and in ass media, ass media uh, no, one s, but I don't know how to how to pronounce it. How do you pronounce it? Ass media, or ass uh, as, ass as media. I think it's ass media. As media, English is not my not first language. Ass media, as media. As, say it like a z. As media. There you go. So you you Google this stuff, and uh, it's right past the the US, bad USB days and Fison and other controllers. You look for it, see what's other what other stuff is interesting. And I came across this, and in 2013, there was a post in a blog, and I'm not talking about flash.ru, some blog somewhere. Yeah, I got this controller, it has some bugs, pluggable, fixed it, it's something to do with SATA, performance, it, uh, it one terabyte drives and above. And there is a link in that uh, company's page. This is a tool from As, As Media to uh, check your firmware version. There's another tool to use to flash a firmware image. Oh, the password to flash is this, by the way. It, spends, it specifies everything. But that's not the, the interesting part. The interesting part is if you, if, if you look at uh, uh, teardowns, and I stumble across this picture in a laptop teardown, and if you can see there's a chip there to the left. That's in a laptop, and that's the USB controller they use. And it's from the same company. And I bet $100 that they have, another, they have firmware updates, and it's the same mechanism. Uh, the best guess we can, we can assume is when you're a company and you make USB controllers, you have a process to manufacture. So you manufacture the chips, but you have your own uh, stencil. You have the, the die. And you have code that you have running through all of them, right? It's the same USB controllers for all of them. But this one you use for this, this one you use for that. So you have slight modifications. The things that, that consistently remain the same across all chips, you don't touch. Right? It's, it's too expensive to develop the entire process for each version of the chip. So if you go on this company's website and you check how many versions of the chip they have, they have a lot. So you go like, okay, 
First assumption, they're all lazy because that's how you keep things cheap. And um, I haven't looked into it. I don't have a laptop with that. Uh, a chip, I think it's, uh, I saw someone with that laptop here. Uh, okay, so you run into the example. So let's see, how do I explain this? The, the start off scenario is this. You, you have malware that gets installed in your system. You, you wander across a watering hole attack or uh, you, you get fished real good or something. And the malware runs, it detects you have a, a specific platform that it knows how to exploit, a specific platform component that it knows how to exploit. It exploits that component, puts in its own um, time bomb in there or something, and uses it to persist. Right? No matter what you do to the malware from that point on, it will always remain. So the demo we're going to show you is uh, a platform that gets attacked by malware. It connects back to uh, a CNC that says, OK, I have discovered a, an internal LTE module that is exploitable, and I'm going to attack it. So you know this machine I'm at, this hash or whatever, an IP, is uh, persistent. Installed it on the, on the platform component. And then AV comes along, kills the malware. AV only kills the malware within the host. It doesn't do host. anything for the LTE module. Yes, thank you for that uh, clarification. The module is still infected. But because it's an LTE module, it can still access yeah, you, the you internet. Can, you can wipe the complete platform also, like just reinstall Windows, and the LTE module yeah. is still infected. Take the hard drive out, put a new one in. That specific module is still infected, and it still communicates with the CNC. And then it reinfects the host, no matter what you install. Let's uh, watch this video. So the, we're going to explain it later. The, the, the screen on the left, you see the SSH there. This is uh, an SSH into an Amazon EC2 instance that is supposedly the CNC server. And uh, I'm starting a listener on that. And to the right, there is this tablet. It's a Windows 8.1 tablet, so it's running an i5. It's pretty cool. The, the tablet, the module that we infected is this tiny thing. Right, if you can all see. This is... Uh, it's, uh, it's M2, which is the, the replacement for mini PCI. Yeah, it's the so, ne next gen... Yeah, next gen form factor. Can, so. can you buy some version so you can pop out... You can buy them. You can't necessarily tell that they're virgin or not. Yeah. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> we have funny stories. This one, this, this is the size of this module. So it's tiny. It's really tiny. Let's play this five minute video. OK, so we power on the tablet. Uh, when you power on the tablet, the, the whole platform powers up, uh, including the, the peripherals. So we start the listener on the server. This is on, on Amazon. And you can see the little red light is blinking fast because we sped up. Then we get a connect back. This connect back is from the module itself. And now we have a shell on the LTE module. And we download a totally legit uh, CD ISO image. So yeah, th this is being downloaded over the LTE connection. Uh, the, the host doesn't actually know that we have this connection up currently. Hold on, hold on. So at this point, you can assume there's brand new operating system after being infected uh, and cleaned, and the LTE module, module is still infected. Now we're telling the, the module itself, load, itself, load yourself as a, as a different USB configuration, present yourself as a CD to the host. And it's autoplay. Uh, an executable and just an animated GIF for the hacking in progress GIF that we all love uh, to watch him do that with the printers. Where is that mouse thing? Okay. Is there a competition with how to do it? <laughs> <laughs> no. 
Um, so there is a problem with this specific part of the demo. Anyone care to guess? Hint, we cheated. It, it, it says it right up on the screen there. Yeah. OK, fine. I, uh, I think you said the word also. We, we enabled autoplay. Right? It's Windows 8.1. It doesn't come autoplay by default. So we said, OK, autoplay. And fine. But. <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, the module itself is independent. We're going to talk about that in a second. It's Actually, wouldn't it be easier to just replace, uh, wouldn't it be easier to just replace uh, any kind of download <laughs> that you do, uh, that the user does of PE that actually uh, has to be executed later? Because actually, you don't have to mess and disconnect the, the LT module. In the avenue of yeah, modem. I mean, you you could since you, since you do have control of the the modem itself, you could do like a man in the middle of the connections and, and replace it. Um, we we did not do that for this particular demo, though. But it's certainly something that's possible. Okay, so you'd say, okay, we cheated. Let's let's show you some hardcore stuff. Where is this house thing? Okay. So now I go and I find the on-screen keyboard because it's a tablet and it's annoying and you got to do an Alt F4 to kill the program because I coded it full screen. I'm an idiot. So worst case scenario, let's tell the LTE to go into UEFI. So it's sending keystrokes. And this is slowed down significantly so that you can actually see what it's typing. Yeah. So it does the shutdown dash R and options and goes and um, really slow down, finds the uh, UEFI settings and goes into BIOS settings and the tablet. Now, in this specific platform, it powers off and then back on to get into BIOS. Um, this was a good design because the LTE module itself gets power cycled as well, so we have to start the listener again and wait for it to contact, to call home again. Now we get to connect back. We uh, reload the uh, USB configuration. Hey, we are also a CD. We are we, USB mouse, USB keyboard, and we send keystrokes from our CNC, and we go and we disable secure boot. It's the key down, uh, arrow down. It's sent re really slow, just so you can see. <laughs> if you can understand what it says. So it says, uh, disabling secure boot will something be yeah, bad. Are you, are you sure? Are you sure? So actually, uh, as a comment on having the captcha on some uh, stupid... Uh, like, that, that would help, but... I, I haven't actually seen any BIOSes that do that yet. So now the tablet boots up with secure boot disabled. At this point, um, you can theoretically boot your own OS image from the LTE card if you want to. Yeah, but because it can present itself as a mass storage device, either a CD-ROM or, or like a USB flash drive, even when BIOS is up and running, you could potentially boot off of that. <laughs> so, here we go. so it reboots. We start the listener again. Gotta be careful here. An in PowerPoint video is interesting. So while, while we wait, I, I tell the, the, the LTE module, here, ping Google while we wait. And it pings Google, and it takes forever for the, for the OS to load. And the OS loads. Now, the fun part comes now. No, that's not the fun part. That's just me opening the device manager to check the, the device is still there. So you can see the USB device. If you can tell, but there's a, this is a Huawei module. I'm saying it right? Huawei. 
No, no surprise, but check this out. So the LTE module is pinging Google. The tablet is in airplane mode now. So the OS went to airplane mode, and the module is still pinging Google. It's an interesting thing to note that the OS can tell its uh, underlying hardware, please do this. And the, the hardware goes like, screw you. I'm going to do whatever I want. This is uh, um, disabling the back door, rebooting the LTE module itself. The OS is fine. It's still running. Remotely, I, I tell the, the module, reboot again, but don't call back home. And it will show up on the host as a regular LTE module, T-Mobile connection. And any moment now? Here we go. And it's fully functional. You kill the Wi-Fi. You still have internet. Totally uh, transparent. You can't know better. That's it. Done. So, so yeah, the, the LTE modem, whatever code that you have running in that module can bring up its own network connection even when you think that the LTE module is disabled uh, within the host. And uh, the, the way that this uh, worked is basically this uh, uh, Huawei module that we uh, did some research in and uh, found some interesting things. And it, it is uh, connected over USB in the M2 socket that we that we mentioned earlier. Yeah, M2 uh, has um, USB 2.0 going through it, USB 3.0, PCIe, a whole bunch of other th stuff. That I, so many things yeah, I can barely de remember. Depending on which key is active, uh, there, there will be different lines. Like, like for uh, is this the B key that's used for? Uh, so when you, when we say a key, we mean the notches. So, yeah, so the, the the notch there, like the position of the notch. Yeah. Uh, determines which key it is. So, like some some will have the the notch a different place. Like uh, SSDs will be keyed differently. Uh, Wi-Fi Bluetooth modules will be keyed differently. Uh, the this uh, WAN module will be keyed differently, so that you aren't like sticking a, a SSD into your w WAN slot, even though the socket is the same width. Yeah. So let's uh, dissect the hack a little bit. How we pop this open. Uh, this is how the module looks like. If you if you remove the the shielding. You see, this, this is an independent small platform. It has a CPU, it has a NAND, it has everything you need to run a flavor of Android. Yeah, th this is basically a, a Qualcomm core that runs Android internally. And uh, it has its own flash on die. Uh, it has its own uh, complete file system. Yeah, so we're breaking it down. We're going to speeding it through. Uh, we got software that runs on the host. That, you, that is used to update the, the device. We have the firmware, which is in the software. The, the, the executable that you use to update the, the, the device is like 100 megs. And, um, and uh, funny enough, if we do, we do a Windows grep. So if, if, if you just uh, run grep, even whether it's Windows or not, <laughs> you, you, can, you can find uh, the hard-coded uh, shadow password for root. Yeah, as part of the firmware update file, and we were able to crack that in like three hours. Yeah, three hours, and you just you get the root username, you got the, the root password. The next step was, okay, how do we gain access to this thing? Because we know there is Linux running on it, there must be a serial port. So we look in the test pads, and we found out that these these two here are a serial port TX and RX. And we, we don't have a picture of it now, but at first we had to solder tiny wires to the pads. And it's really hard. So you spend two hours or three hours soldering these tiny wires on the pads. And, and then he'd give it to me and I'd break it. In 10 minutes. So an example here. This is one of the modules I gave Jesse. It says panic in the back because it panics every time you boot it. <laughs> So to, to work around that, we have this development kit. We have it here if you want to come over afterwards and have a look. We basically MacGyvered uh, pogo pins with duct tape and hot glue on a piece of wood that stick out here. And you put the module in this NGFF slot, and it just 
taps the TXRX and we connect it to the bus pirate and we get serial console. And that's it. We have a root shell on the device. Yeah, and from that, that point then, you on, can, then you can log in, start looking at what's actually available on the system. And, and that's... Yeah, yeah th this, is, this is just for like exploration and yeah. getting a better understanding of what's on the system. So. Well, well, this the, one is th uh, this is with the password that we cracked out of yeah. the firmware file. So and the password it, itself was a default password. Yes, it, it's the default password for the distribution of Linux that they're running. So yeah, <laughs> you uh, could have saved yourself three hours and I know, just tried yeah. that from the beginning. <laughs> right, yeah. We like a good challenge. So once we get access to everything on this platform, we can start analyzing how the updates work, how every tiny process written by the vendor is used, and whatever, whatnot. And we did all that, and we came up with this. Uh, the, the, the exploit Jesse wrote is a live Linux kernel patch to patch the USB, USB gadget on the kernel on the card. Yeah, so, so basically, uh, they were not doing secure update with this module, and the, the firmware was only protected by a CRC. So it was pretty, pretty easy to, to find the, the place in the, the Windows updater where basically when you run the Windows updater, it would recalculate the firmware, the CRC of the firmware inside the module, or inside its own file, see if it matched the CRC that was also listed in the, the firmware image. And if it didn't match, it would just complain and give you a, a log error about how the, the, the CRC verification failed. Uh, if, if you go into the firmware updater and basically knock out that check, so it sends it onto the module anyway, it would, the, mo the Windows updater would be fine with it. But then when the, the module would do its own uh, parallel calculation to see, does this firmware actually match the CRC? And it would say, no, it doesn't. So it would, it would error out. But we basically, I think we patched like six opcodes to basically get the Windows updater to recalculate the CRC for us and put it back into the firmware image before it passed it on to the module. And then the module was totally fine with it. So we didn't even need to do any kind of real like I, I had like some some tools to extract firmware images and rebuild them and put in like whatever whatever file system or whatever uh, yeah. kernel that I wanted, but I didn't even need to recalculate the CRC. I just replaced the image and then let the tool recalculate the CRC for me, and it took it just fine. Yeah, it wasn't even if you do embedded stuff, it wasn't even a compressed image with you got unsquash FS and all that magic. All like unpacked right there. Well, yeah, it was like a, a YAFS two file system, so you could just see all the text and. A complete plain text, and uh, this this is a, an ARM core, so it, it certainly has some processing power and can do things like RSA signature verification, but they just weren't. So um, we're going to look at the affected products. If you have an HP laptop, <laughs> we're sorry. Um, the, the 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 Huawei module is being manufactured in three uh, three types. V for the U.S. market, J for Asia, and E for Europe. Usually in Europe, they, the ME906E is what HP uh, uses to uh, sell with its LTWN enabled laptops, which are listed there. Yeah, so HP takes the Huawei module and just rebrands it with its, its LT. I can never remember the, the model number. Yeah. Uh, there are other vendors that do the same. Yeah. You can find that on yourself. On yourself, we're not going to mention them. It's kind of like shaming. So after we did this uh, presentation at DefCon, we did a different presentation specifically focused on this module. But um, uh, we got an email from a random individual that said this: "Thank you uh, for your research and giving the DefCon talk. I was in the audience. Way." Uh, Huawei, Huawei is refusing to provide the ME906 firmware update directly to end users. Instead, they're referred to OEM partners, Sony, et cetera. Uh, in turn, knows nothing about this. Finger pointing. OK, you can read this. Uh, the point is, as someone disgruntled, um, Huawei is the OEM. They manufacture the device. Their business is to sell it to uh, vendors who rebrand it onwards and sell it, in, case, in this case, Sony, is, according to this guy. Uh, HP, whatever. Then it's the, uh, the the distributor, HP or Sony, to responsibility to take care of its end users. So this is an interesting case. What do you do if you have one of these? You have to wait for your update from HP. Uh, I think they released it uh, two weeks later. And uh, they had it already and set up, so you can probably Google it and find it. 
Um, I don't know about the other ones. Um, we only handled this with HP. Actually, we handled it with Huawei because they told us, we'll take care of all the OEMs. We make the module. You find a problem in the module, we'll take care of it. We'll take care of everyone else. So we kind of assume, okay, makes sense. And uh, one last thing. If you do want one of these modules, you can go on eBay and just type in uh, M2 LTE. And these are the, the first ones that pop up. It's like 40 bucks, 50 bucks a module. And that's it. So now it's time for questions. All right. Thank you. We made it in time. We made it in time. <laughs> okay. I'm, not, I'm not allowed to give this to you if you take it. Oh, OK. <laughs> Strict protocols. OK. Can... Uh, any questions? Were there any questions? So we, we didn't analyze the fix so yet. The, they, they released the fix at 10 AM the day we gave our talk at DEF CON. So. And well, the, the funny thing is that we found out, you, maybe tell the HP story? Or? <laughs> so a, HP, We got a phone call the day, yeah. like 16 hours before the talk. Uh, don't, don't say HP. <laughs> Why? We told them five months ago. Uh, they need more time to, fi to finish the patch. Okay, so it took them about another week and a half to finish the patch, and then they released all the, the their own CVE, HP dash something. Every company has their own, and uh, and and yeah, <laughs> no, and finished their patching and everything was fine. But it was it was interesting, like you know, relaxing the date before your talk, and then you get a phone call. Hey, shut up. Okay. What? Uh, just to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it happens, you know. Yeah. You put the vendor in a spotlight. You give him, you even give him six months, and they need another week to finish testing or something. If, especially if it's a big vendor, we know how that feels. So, yeah. Anyone else? So, so we we haven't looked specifically at the patch to make sure they did it correctly. But according to them, they did replace it with a full RSA signature verification. But we haven't verified that. The chipset on the card supports all that. Yeah. Well, that that just made it easier. So, like, if you if you if you have the same hardware that's running, like VXWorks or some some other embedded OS, you still have the same hardware capabilities, and you could do the exact same thing. It just made it much much easier for us to get in and figure out what was going on. Because, like, when we when we logged in over the UART and started looking around the file system, we discovered it's an Android kernel. It has it has uh, shell scripts in the in the file system to change the USB composition to like mass storage device. So it, it like told us exactly, here's how to go do this. And we, we did actually have, to get this working, uh, uh, Android by default does not uh, include a keyboard in the USB gadget. So uh, I had to basically create a kernel module that live patched itself into the Android gadget in order to enable that keyboard hit functionality. But it, it definitely made, it, it just made it easier to do it in uh, Linux. So it's certainly possible with with other uh, firmware that's running on there. We were also told during DEF CON that this module is used in uh, servers and data centers to provide backup. <laughs> <laughs> LTE, uh, backup over LTE in case the LAN fails. Actually, uh, the, uh, this kind of stuff, I think, wasn't it in two, um, sorry, w w wasn't it in two IPMI related uh, basic components that were connected to actually uh, this kind of uh, communication module back in the days before in 3G? But which were already uh, Linux Linux systems. So that would make sense. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember any case like that. But that would make sense. If you own a data center, you assume everything is secure. If you've done LTE and you have the money, you you if you have an outage, you wanna you want a line, even if it's a cell tower based line, LTE or some some sort of cell provider that's not ISP like LAN. <laughs> so when is Intel going to integrate? 
remote management system directly into the chip. Didn't that already was the direction with V? I've, I've heard that might happen eventually. Yeah, uh, I think they released some chip, the V, sorry, a kind of a V Pro, whatever. I wouldn't know anything about that. Find an Intel employee, I'll ask. <laughs> no, I, w I would like to hear about that. I don't know anything about that.